All right, what's going on, you guys? It's your boy, Jake Light, your favorite real estate investor, and welcome to the Complete Beginner's Guide to Flipping Houses in 2023. I will be your host for the afternoon. I'm so freaking excited. I want you to watch closely, take notes if you need to. Feel free to rewind back if there's something key that you want to write down a second time, and let's get into this. Let's go! Now with house flipping, you can do it part-time, you can do it full-time, you can do it in your own backyard, or you could do it clear across the country remotely. And regardless of which way you opt to do it, process is the same. And that's what we're gonna break down in this video. Now, a lot of times when people get into this business or if they're on the outside looking in and wondering when the time is right, a lot of times people falsely believe that they have to have a ton of their own cash saved up. If you're anything like me, and I was broke when I first started this game about 11 years ago. And since then I flipped over 900 houses, done it with other people's money. But at the time when I first got in, I thought that I had to have a fat stack of cash saved up, sitting there in my bank account, burning, burning, burning a hole in my pocket. That's a tongue twister for you. I thought that I had to have a bunch of money saved up to get into this game. I thought it was a rich person's game. Now make no mistake about it, it does create rich people, but you do not have to have your own money or any money at all in order to get, to get into this business. Now secondly, many people think they have to have construction experience. I know that for myself, I definitely was intimidated by the construction piece. I thought that I needed to be a contractor or needed to shadow contractors or know how everything worked, that is also not the case. And finally, many people think that they need to be a real estate agent or have some fancy title, fancy license, some type of certification in order to buy and sell houses in today's market. That is also simply not the case. You can flip houses, I can flip houses, we can all flip houses anywhere in the country by following the steps that we're gonna go through in this presentation. Follow my lead. So what steps are we gonna go through, you may ask? Glad you asked that. Let me go ahead and jump right into it. So as an overview of this complete beginner's guide to flipping houses in 2023, we're gonna talk about what makes a good deal. We're gonna talk about where to find property. And most importantly, we're gonna talk about how to find the money. Money. Now I've done this, as I said, over 900 times. We're getting close to 1,000. And every single time I've done it the same way using the same structure and it's a repetitive process that anybody can go and plug into in order to get similar results that I've got, that people in my mentorship program have got. And so that's what I want for you out of this video. Keep up the momentum. Now, first off, let's talk about what makes a good deal. Now, a house does not need to be a beater or be completely falling over, have the cabinets coming off the side of the, of the wall, doesn't need to have rain dumping through the roof in order to be a good flip. The condition doesn't necessarily matter, believe it or not. Also, you do not need HGTV skills or interior design skills. You don't have to have a Pinterest page with all the modern trends and the different styles. You don't need to have to know how to go to an antique shop and pick the right you know, supplemental piece for your kitchen or for the dining room in order to do this. You also do not need to find houses only in good neighborhoods or certain crime rate neighborhoods or in the good school districts. Doesn't matter if it's luxury homes or entry level homes. They could be 500 square foot homes, 5,000 square foot homes. Either way, there is no method to the madness. What does matter though, in order to find a good deal, is you do need solid numbers. Okay, we're gonna go over those numbers in a second here. You also need to find a trend, and we're gonna go over that as well. And finally, you do need good percentages. This is a numbers and trends game. It is a math game more than any type of HGTV interior design game. You don't need to be artistic to successfully play this game in today's market. Matter of fact, sometimes when you're really artistic and have that interior design kick and you wanna be an HGTV star, it can oftentimes work against you. Let's go into why. So with numbers, there are three main numbers that you need to understand in order to flip houses. Number one is the purchase price. This is the price point that we put the house under contract at in order to buy it. Number two is the rehab cost. Now the rehab cost is what it costs to renovate the home and put it into good condition. And then finally, we have the after repair value. That's what we can resell the property for in the future. Now, the purchase price, like I said, it's the price that you put the house under contract to buy it for. Typically, we make offers to sellers that are listing their homes for sale. Sometimes we make them through real estate agents and we make these offers in order in hopes to get the seller to agree to our price point and agree to sell the property to us. 
Now the rehab costs, it's the price point that we agree to with our contractors to do all the necessary renovation. And with contractors, we want them to be uh, experienced. We want them to have good reviews and we want them to be investor friendly, meaning we want them to have some experience working on flips and investment properties in their past. With us, we're doing the entire house. We're not just doing a kitchen or a hallway or a bathroom. So we need them to have the experience to be able to run an entire project just like that. Now the ARV, AKA the after repair value, is a price point that you can resell the property for after all the renovations are completed. The after repair value is the most important and foundational piece in the entire house flipping process. Uh, it's the end that we begin with. It, a lot of times I like to tell people we begin with the end in mind. We know what we can resell the property for at the end of the day. Because of that, we know if we're buying the property for a discounted rate or a profitable rate. The after repair value tells us all we need to know about how much our property is gonna sell for, how long it's gonna take to sell, what we need to do to the property in order to sell it for that price point. And that's the foundational piece, like I said, that we have to start with in order to put all of our numbers together. Now, <clears throat> before we uh, get into the different trends and things that are implied by figuring out the after repair value, it's important to understand that while the purchase price, the renovation costs, the rehab costs, and after repair value are the key numbers, the order that we figure them out is completely backwards based on what most people think. We always establish the after repair value first. We need to understand what we can resell the property for at the end of the day. Like I said, begin with the end in mind. And then we work backwards to figure out what the rehab cost is gonna be for the project. And only after we have these two numbers, at that point we understand what we can offer on the property as a purchase price. So the process is determine the ARV first and then figure out the rehab costs and then only at that point do we know what we can pay for that property. Now, in addition to the numbers, trends are super duper important. When establishing the after repair value, we need to find a trend of what the similar properties have been selling for in the neighborhood. Matter of fact, that's how we figure out and determine what the after repair value is. So typically, if we're looking at a neighborhood, let's say we wanna flip a house on 123 Main Street, and we're looking within that neighborhood to find a trend, to find an after repair value, uh, we wanna look uh, look at the comps, which means comparable properties that are similar to the house that we are trying to flip. Now, the way we figure that out is we want it to be in a similar neighborhood. We want to look at properties that have sold in that neighborhood. We want those houses to be a similar age to ours. So if ours is built in 1975, we want it to be right around that same age. We want them to be similar size. If our house is 1,500 square feet, we probably want all the similar properties that have sold recently to be between 13 and maybe 1,600 square feet. We also want them to be similar style. And that goes kind of along with the age of the property. Typically in every decade, there's very distinct characteristics of what houses look like. There may be ranch style homes or Victorian Victorian homes or craftsman homes, and they're typically indicative of the age of the property. We also want them to have sold recently. So in a neighborhood, we want to see everything that's sold in the last three, maybe six months of similar properties. We are comparing apples to apples in order to determine how much we can sell our property for. Real estate gives clues. It's not something where you have to reinvent the wheel and it's not rocket science. We're looking at the neighborhood to see what's been working and then we can understand what's gonna work for our property. So this is kind of what running comps in a neighborhood would look like. We look at an overhead map within a neighborhood and all those little blue data points on that map are the different properties that have recently sold, say in the last three months or maybe six months. And if these properties are consistent, these price points that are on the screen, 390, 400, 390, 391, 399, 389. If we can get a trend with these properties, then we know what we can sell our property for as well. So these comps give us the after repair value of the home, but in addition to that, they also tell us how long it's gonna take for our property to sell. And also, probably most importantly, what we need to do to our property 
in order for it to sell at that price point. Once we see all those trends, and let's go ahead and go back, once we see all these properties that have sold for that price point, we can go online and look at the pictures of the home. We can see what those kitchens look like, what type of flooring they have, what the bathroom looks like, what the exterior or the front of the house looks like. Does it have grass? Does it have gravel? We can really see what's going on in these houses. And typically, if there's a trend in the price point, there's also a trend in the finishes of the homes. And that tells us everything we need to do to our home in order to sell it for the price point we're looking at. So if I'm looking at a neighborhood and I see uh, you know, everything that's sold, if I see kitchens that look like this with white shaker cabinets and dark granite countertops and the fake hardwood. That's bait. Uh, and the gray paint and the recessed lighting and you know the stainless steel appliances, then you better believe if I get a property that looks like this, I know exactly what I need to do to this home and exactly what I need to tell contractors to give me a price point or a rehab bid to do. So that's how we take houses that look like the one on the left and turn them into the one that, that you see on the right. And that is how we make our money. We do what works. We don't necessarily do what we like. Now, oftentimes we do like the end result, but there's some areas that what works isn't necessarily what we would do to our own house. Real estate investing is a numbers and a trends game, not a personal preference game. It's not an interior design game. We're not doing what we like to the home. We're doing what the area likes. Now also we have percentages. So once we have our numbers and our trends identified for any property out there, we want to make sure that our purchase price allows us to have a 10% profit in the deal. And what I mean by 10% is we want to project to make 10% of what the resale value of the home is. So if we have a property that has a $500,000 after repair value, we need to project to make at least $50,000 in profit. If we have a home that has a $350,000 after repair value, we need to project to make a minimum of $35,000 in profit. And if we have a home that has a $270,000 after repair value, we need to project to make a $27,000 profit. It's always 10% of what that ARV number is, which is why, yet again, the after repair value is the most important number in this entire game, in the entire equation, um, and it's something that we need to make sure to get right every single time. We make our money when we buy, and so you might as well buy correctly. In order to buy correctly, we need to know that after repair value, and then we work backwards to make sure that we have a purchase price that allows us that 10% profit margin. All right, second, where to find properties heading into 2023. Now, there are two types of properties that are out there. One is on-market properties, and the other type is off-market properties. An on-market property is one that you may see a for sale sign. Uh, the seller has hired a real estate agent. They've done the whole you know, uh, pomp and circumstance of listing to the world and declaring to the world, this house is for sale. Uh, and a lot of properties are like that. I personally buy 90% of my houses that are on market properties. I love it when the seller has committed to selling their house, but that's not the only type of property. There's also what we call off market properties. Now those houses are private sales, okay? They don't necessarily have sellers that have declared to the world that they're selling their house. Matter of fact, the sellers may not have even wanted to sell their houses, okay? And so a lot of times these off-market properties, not a ton of people know about them, but because of that, they can be extremely lucrative. And while it's only about 10% of the properties that I've personally bought, they still have been some of the best deals. Now, with both of these types of resources, uh, with both these types of properties, there are two types of resources to find any type of property out there. And I'm gonna show you what those two are. The first type of resource is human resources, okay? And the second type of resources is technology. Now, human side of lead generation is always the most effective. Um, if you have humans that are working for you, you let them know what you're looking for, you teach them how to find properties for you, it can be very, very effective because this human mind up here allows us to connect with other people. This is, in addition to being a numbers game, it's also a relationship game. And so having a human out there doing the work for you is always the most effective. Now it's also the most intimidating 
Now, the other side of things, which is the tech side of things, the lead generation coming from tech is always the easiest, okay? Because it is a numbers game, we can use technology pretty effectively to find really, really good deals, but because it lacks the human interaction side of things, it's not always the most effective. So I like to implement both the human side and the tech side into constantly having properties sent to me that I can make offers on and flip and you know make money on. So the human side, we've got two main aspects of the human side. We have real estate agents, okay? Real estate agents are licensed in whatever state they're in. They're the ones that are dealing directly with the seller of the house. A lot of times they've been hired to go and find a buyer to be able to buy that property. Real estate agents are great. They network a lot. They like to go to events, go to the bar. They all connect with each other. That is their job. And for me, if I have a real estate agent working on my behalf, now they get a commission from the seller of the house when I buy a property. So they get paid, not necessarily from me, but they also are in the know. They have inside information on what houses are coming up, who's selling what, whether or not a seller is willing to have a lower price point than the price point that they're asking for a property. So because of reasons like that, I love and make a lot of money off of working with real estate agents. Now, on the human side for off-market properties, we also have what's called wholesalers. Now, wholesalers are people that call folks that you know may have a beat up house, or let's say someone has a second home and the house is vacant or it's a vacation home, or it was just a rental and they evicted tenants and now the home is sitting there vacant. There can be a number of ways that wholesalers do their work. Wholesalers will go knock on doors. Uh, they'll send letters in the mail. They'll cold call these owners and make offers on their properties in order to get them to commit to selling these houses. So they're not on the market, right? They haven't declared to the world that the property is for sale, but wholesalers get in there and they go and convince these homeowners to sell their homes. And if they can convince a homeowner to sell that home, what they do is they take that contract between the wholesaler and the homeowner and they sell the rights to it to someone like me, to someone like you that wants to flip that house, that wants to buy that house. And they typically do it for a profit. For example, if they convince a homeowner of 123 Main Street to sell their home for $190,000 and they have a contract at $190,000, they can turn around and sell the rights to that contract to someone like me for $200,000 making them a $10,000 profit. And for me, I may make $50,000 on that flip. So I love wholesalers. I don't utilize them as often as real estate agents, but the fact that with both of these human resources, real estate agents and wholesalers, the human connection that they have in the real estate transaction business is very, very effective. Now on the tech side of things, we have free websites and apps which I love, and there's an emergence of them right now. It's way different than even a decade ago when I first got into the business. And we have social media, which I use pretty damn effectively. And if you're trying to get into this business and play this game, I would suggest you do the same. Now, um, for finding real estate agents, I love using Zillow. That's the only thing I love using Zillow for. I have a love-hate relationship with them. I don't like finding properties on Zillow but I love finding agents on Zillow through what's called the agent finder. So if you go to Zillow.com, at the top, there's a menu, and right there toward the middle, it says agent finder. If you click that, this is what it'll look like. It'll allow you to find agents in any location. You can search them by name. You can search them by their specialty. Uh, are they a buyer's agent? Are they a seller's agent? Do they like investment properties? Do they do multifamily? Do they do land? Do they do condos or apartments? Um, and usually they say that their specialty is all of that. So take that with a grain of salt. But in addition to that, you can you know, uh, filter them out based on what language they speak as well. There's a lot of people that think, oh, my English isn't great. Or you know, I speak Spanish first or Mandarin first or whatever it is. You can find agents that have specialties in speaking whatever language you speak as a primary language um, to be able to connect with them and, and communicate with them more effectively. So Zillow is really, really good for that. There are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of agents in every market in the country. So this is a very good way to find real estate agents and take a look at their reviews as well. 
Now, as far as finding properties is concerned, I've made millions of dollars in profit off of the Redfin app or the Redfin website, depending on whether I've got my phone or if I'm sitting at a desk. Redfin is hands down the most effective way to use technology to find properties, and I'm gonna show you why. So with Redfin, uh, this is what it looks like on a desktop, and you can go in and search any market in the country or any zip code and plug it in, and what it'll do is give you data for however long ago you want. You can say the last three months, last six months, last three weeks, last year. You can see everything that's sold, everything that's currently for sale. You can uh, categorize it by houses only or apartments only or duplexes only. And you can even take it a step further of saying, hey, I only want properties that are houses that are under a thousand square feet that have sold in the last three months that are um, that's built between 1970 and 1980. You can really narrow it down. And what I really like about it is on the left side of the screen, you have a map with all the data points. Then on the right side of the screen, you have your filters and any data points on the left, you can click on on the right and it'll show you all the pictures and the listing information and kind of what happened with each property if it's sold or what's currently going on with the property if it's for sale. So I love, love, love Redfin for that. Uh, this is what it looks like when you're going through the different filters right there on the right side of the screen. And what I really, really like about Redfin is it even has on its filters a place where you can find fixer uppers only. So you can literally go into any city in the country, let's say Dallas, and pull up Redfin and then go into the filters and say, I want to see fixer uppers only that are for sale. And it'll show you based on the price point. It'll show you based on the description. If it says, hey, this property needs TLC or it needs a contractor to come in, investors only, it will go ahead and go through that and filter those results for you and allows us to have a lot of low hanging fruit. And this is very, very underutilized. Technology is underutilized in general, which is why I'm making videos like this to share with you what's truly possible in today's marketplace. Now, other free websites and apps, <clears throat> other free websites and apps that we have are Zillow, uh, which I'm kind of torn on. You have Trulia, you have Realtor.com, and all these work the same way. I just love that Redfin user, user interface and it makes uh, things very, very easy for me in establishing values of properties, determining after repair values and anything I need to do when I don't have access to a real estate agent right there in front of me. Now, in addition to that, I love biggerpockets.com. Bigger Pockets is a message board where investors that are new, that are experienced from all over the sphere of real estate investing, whether it's apartments, condos, leases, landlords, anything at all, you can find them on biggerpockets.com. What I really like it for isn't necessarily how some of the investors have egos and they argue with each other about who's right and who's wrong. Side note, every investor thinks that they're right. It is a very egotistically driven business. But what I really, really like about biggerpockets.com is you can find wholesalers that are actively trying to find people like me to buy their houses from them. And so you go in um, on their forums, they have all sorts of different filters. You can go into discussions and search discussions based on flipping, based on lenders, based on you know landlords, whatever it is, there are keyword searches that'll allow you to find the wholesalers that are out there trying to find you in order to create a match made in heaven. Really go check out Bigger Pockets. Side note, it is free and it's very good as a free app and a free website. However, they do have a paid pro membership that I think is 100 or 200 bucks a year. And that also kind of enhances the features of the website. Doesn't mean you have to use it like that. You can definitely use it for free, but just as a disclaimer, and I don't get paid from this, but as a disclaimer, they also have a paid version of this site. Now, in addition to that, I love, love, love social media, whether it be Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Snapchat, LinkedIn, YouTube. It's a very good way for people in 2023 who are using their social media channels to market their businesses to the world. It's a great way to connect. Uh, social media, if you use it as a producer and a creator rather than a consumer, it can be a very, very, very effective networking tool. I would highly recommend having presence on at least Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. You're probably watching this on YouTube, not necessarily sure where that is right now, but you wouldn't be able to find someone like me if I didn't have an intentional effort 
of putting my social media presence in front of as many people as possible. That's the way that business is played in 2023. Now also, something that not a lot of people use is Meetup. Meetup Meetup.com, there's an app, there's a website. What Meetup does, it allows you to filter through any area based on any keyword local groups that meet up on a regular basis or a monthly basis or maybe even a one-time basis of people that have similar interests. I've done a ton of meetup groups where I've gone in and I've sat down with a group of 10, 20, 30, watched a presentation, done the networking events, and I found tons of real estate agents and tons of wholesalers that have sent me properties that I bought and made a lot of money on. It's all about getting involved making sure that you create rapport with other people that are in your space and creating situations that's beneficial to everybody involved. All right, so now let's get into how to find the money. Now the process of finding OPM, which means other people's money, is the most intimidating part of getting into the business, especially for beginners. But a little secret here, it's also the easiest. And it's backwards compared to what most people think about it. Most people think, incorrectly I might add, that they need to go find a lender first and have all these connections first before they can do anything. And then after they have those connections, then they can go and find the properties. And they do that after that. And because people have that false expectation of what they need, a lot of times people stay on the sidelines forever or always hesitate. They always think that the timing's not right because they don't have a lender that they know and they don't know how to go about finding a lender and so they just don't take action. That is not the correct way to do this. This is what I thought when I first got into the business and I learned that this is absolutely false right off the bat. Now the correct way to do it is you find the property first and then only after you find the property That's when you go connect with the lenders. The lenders are a lot more receptive to having a conversation with us if we have a profitable profitable property in hand that we can present to them. So here's the process. Number one, we get a property from either humans or tech resources, okay? Let's say a real estate agent sends us a lead or a wholesaler sends us a lead or we find one using a Redfin auto search or a fixer upper filter on Redfin. We find that property, okay? Second, we run our numbers on that property. We get our after repair value. We get an idea of what the renovations are gonna cost. And we look at the trends to see if all those numbers are consistent and we know what type of finishes the house house needs, how long it's gonna take to do, all that stuff that we covered earlier in this guide. And if it's a good deal, we make a strong offer on it, making sure that we have a minimum of that 10% of profit built in because we're doing this to make money. This is not a charity, my friends. Now, if your offer is accepted at that point, we go find our lenders. Okay. Some lenders will want to fund your entire deal. Okay. Especially if it's a good deal, they'll say, we'll give you all of the money that you need to do this. But other lenders will want you to provide a down payment, maybe 10% of the purchase price or 5% of the purchase price or 10% of the rehab fees. And that's probably the most common type of lender that you'll find. So depending on where you're at and what type of financial situation you're trying to apply to this business, you can either put that down payment down yourself. Or if you're like me, when I first started, I had 700 bucks in my bank account. I had no ability. I had no business trying to figure out how I was going to put my own money into a deal. My, my own money was non-existent. And so when the lender wants a down payment, and you can't cover it or you don't want to cover it. These days, I could definitely cover it, but I just don't want to. I want a second lender to come in and cover my down payment on my behalf. So I have a big lender that covers most of the project costs. Then I have a small lender that comes in and covers my down payment and any interest payments or fees that I have on top of it. So I can do it with 100% other people's money, and that's not a dime out of my own pocket. So that's the way we do it. Um, that's the way that, that you know the game works. You have to find the property first. And then if the property works, you make an offer on it. If that offer is accepted at that point, we find either one or even potentially two lenders. And it all depends on what type of financial situation you're in. If you don't have any money, you find those two lenders and they cover that deal. And if it's a good deal, it's not terribly difficult to find that combination of lenders that'll fund it with 100% other people's money, my friend. So the key areas to focus on, I have a couple little things that I want to especially 
put out there is because this is a beginner's guide, there's two different areas where beginners oftentimes overlook. We can't have anyone freak out out there, okay? We've got to keep our composure. We've got too far. There's too much to lose. We've got to keep our composure. So number one, I want to make sure that you always have ARV discipline. When you're determining the resale value of the house, you want to make sure you look at that criteria that we went over earlier. You want to make sure it's in the same neighborhood, the same age, the same style, the same size, right? We want everything to be as similar as possible to ours, and we want it to have sold recently. A lot of times, these real estate agents and these wholesalers will come to us and tell us to look at other properties that are outside of the neighborhood or, you know, 50 years newer or, you know, that have something that's different than our property in order to make us think that the after repair value is much, much higher. The reason they do this is because they get paid if we buy the property, regardless of whether we buy it for a good price or a bad price. They don't get paid based on how strong of a deal it is. They get paid only if they close the deal. So a lot of times they will try to get us to stretch our criteria to feel like the property is worth more than it is so we can pay more for the property and that allows them to get paid. Okay, we want to buy properties based on our criteria because we make our money when we buy correctly, not just when we buy. We need to buy correctly. So do not stretch your comps. Stay super disciplined when it comes to running your comps and finding out your ARV. Now, second, with contractor bids, make sure you always get three of these, at least three of these. A lot of times because contractors can be very intimidating, we find one that we like. They give us a contract, you know, a bid for rehab costs and everything works out. We hit our 10% and we move forward. Well, what happens if that contractor gets sick or what happens if you don't get along and you have to fire them? You want to make sure that you have a backup contractor, a plan B and then also a plan C. So in the case that you do need to fire someone, you can pick up right where they left off and have a contractor in place that has a similar budget and has a similar expectation of what they need to do to the house in order to flip it in the way that you like. So always follow this guide to ensure your success. I don't want anybody going out there blind, especially with what the market's doing and the big transfer of wealth that we're expecting in 2023. I want you to make sure you have a method to the madness. I don't want it to be chaotic. I want you to be very intentional with what you're doing out there. And of course, my friends, if you're interested in learning more, being coached by my team or working with me one-on-one -on -one and helping you flip houses with my entire business on a platter, feel free to hit the link in the description. You guys, happy investing. It's been real. Take it easy. Talk to you soon.